Hello, my name is Tim Claussen, and I'm here with my guest, Mark Westner, who is the president of the Mennonite Brethren Biblical Seminary. Mark, welcome here. Thanks, Tim. It's good to be here. Yeah, and today we are just on the subject of exploring the Bible. Um, you know, at Central Heights, we want to help equip our people, and we thought it'd be really good just to have a conversation with someone who teaches on it. Uh, we're going to start our conversations sort of at the shallow end, and then eventually work our way deeper, because I think sometimes when we think of this subject, we f we feel like everybody knows what we know, but that's not necessarily the case, and we, we just want to bring everybody along to help us understand more about this book and why it should be impactful in our life. Yeah, so that's good. So I'm looking at Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse 5, and it says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and, and, and you be found a liar. So the Bible says that its words are pretty important and not to be taken lightly. And yeah. so maybe let, let me throw you a softball question. First of all, like, actually, what is the Bible? Yeah, that's a great question. What is the Bible? I'd probably look at it two different ways. One is it's actually the, the book that we have in front of us uh, in terms of, you know, it's 66 books in English and there's an Old Testament and New Testament and it's written over, you know, a thousand years with different authors. And that's something that we can go to the store and we can hold and, and it's a book we can read and study. But it's also God's revelation to us. Uh, when God cho chooses to reveal himself to humanity, he does it through creation, most directly through Jesus, but mm -hmm. one of the ways is through a written word that we've come to call Scripture. So it kind of plays two, two layers there. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a book we can read and touch, but it also originates from God somehow. And, right. and that's what makes it, I think, so, so powerful. Even that verse that you read, it's not just concepts of truth, but it also talks about God's relationship with us. Yeah. That, right? And those things all come together in, in the richness of the Bible. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the two Testaments, so we have yeah. the Old and the New. Uh, how did the Old come into being, and when, when was it recognized mm. as God's Word to His people? Yeah. So the Old Testament is sometimes called the First Testament or the Tanakh, if you're Jewish. It's the same text, mm -hmm. uh, but just different groups will label it different things. Uh, has three basic sections. So the, the Law, or the Torah, or sometimes Christians will call it the Pentateuch. So the Law, the Prophets, and the Writings. And in general, uh, those three sections came into kind of being called authoritative or canonical in that order. Mm -hmm. So the law first, um, there's a story about King Josiah and about the seventh century where he's looking in the temple and he discovers this book of the law. And he's like, what is this? I've, this has been lost in history. And so there's a reference there how th that first section was already authoritative. Uh, it had been lost at that point, but he refound it essentially. Mm -hmm. So we know at least by that point that was canonical or, or scriptural. Um, and then the prophets and the writings were kind of, as they were written, they, were, they became recognized as canonical after that. So by the time of Jesus, uh, probably 150 years-ish before Jesus, there was mm -hmm. a, an established, what we would say Old Testament, Jews would call it the Tanakh, but that text was in place. And so that was the, the scriptures that Jesus used and the first Christians used. Yeah. And then the New Testament... Yeah, it so comes after that. It does come mm -hmm. after that, and there it's a little bit different of a story, whereas the Old Testament has uh, a large uh, time span and maybe some closer geography. The New Testament's different. It's, um, the time frame is much shorter, but the geography is bigger, so it's written in places like what we would call now Israel and Syria, um, Turkey, Greece, mm -hmm. Rome. And uh, so in general, first century, the books were all written. And by the second century, they were recognized as being canonical or authoritative, some of them right away. There's even examples of Peter talking about Paul's writing and saying, hey, this is scripture. And so some of them right. were pretty quickly recognized as that. And then by the end of the third century, the collection that we would have, the 27 books in the New Testament, yeah, uh, that was recognized as a, as a collection at that point. Okay, so obviously Old Testament, New Testament were written in English. <laughs> we're reading them in English. <laughs> we're reading them in English. Can you tell us a little bit about, like, yeah, after they're written in their original languages, now we have all these Bibles and yeah. access to all kinds of different translations. How, yeah. how did that happen? Yeah. Oh, there's so many layers to that. Um, but first, I guess, just remembering that it's three languages. So Hebrew is the bulk of the Old Testament, a little mm -hmm. bit of Aramaic in some sections, and then the New Testament was Greek, so three different languages. And those were just the languages of the day. They weren't special languages or anything unique about them. Those were just the languages that people spoke during those eras. Right. Um, and so if you look at kind of the, the history and how, how did we go from uh, the Word of God, something originating in God's mind, to what we have in front of us now, we can go to the store and buy 27 different versions of it. Yeah. Uh, you could 
kind of put it into three sections, inspiration, transmission, and translation. And inspiration just speaks to how did the divine author, how did God get his words onto some sort of written document, a manuscript, a tablet, or whatever. So what's that process? The second is transmission. So how did we go from some, something that was originally written down to how did it get copied over the years and collected and become authoritative? Because that's mm-hmm. a, a process as well. And then translation speaks to uh, how do we go from those manuscripts that we have that were written in, in other languages and other countries to something that we can go to the store and buy in English. And so those are the big three sections. And um, mm-hmm. so, yeah, just to unpack those really quickly, inspiration is this beautiful dance of how God, uh, in, his, in his sovereignty and in his grace, speaks to human authors. And, and here's what needs to be said, but it also allows the human authors to actually use their own personalities in writing it. So it's not just like a verbatim scribe kind of thing. It's right. right there's Like a monkey on a typewriter. It is definitely not a monkey on a typewriter. And a beautiful <laughs> mm-hmm. example of that is looking at two of the Gospels, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, you know, if you read the whole thing, it's it's fast, lots of words of like uh, things, this happened immediately. It's short to the point, like it just moves. It's a very fast moving book. And then John is another gospel writer, much slower, uh, lots of deep kind of abstract thought behind mm-hmm. things. And so both were writing on behalf of God, but their distinct personalities came through in their writing. And so that speaks to kind of that whole, the mystery so almost, almost of inspiration and how does God speak stuff out, but it's still his word, but it also takes kind of shape through the author's personalities. Yeah, uh, That's the inspiration piece. And then the other two, of course, are, we, could, we could dive into those too. Yeah. I actually like, I mean, I think it's great that we have different human part, uh, people writing it, giving mm-hmm. us, in a sense, a different human flavor. Yeah. And I know, they wrote, it. I know they wrote with different purposes as yeah. well, but yeah, I think it's like... Um, yeah, it's like harmony or music, you know, when you have more voices, yeah, it, it absolutely. actually enriches it if they're in unity. Yeah, and yeah. I think that, yeah, the unified story we often hear about is something yeah. that is incredible in the Bible. Do you want to speak yeah. to that at all? Yeah, well, I, I think you're exactly right. It, it is, it's a beautiful, in English anyways, there's 66 books, the number's a little bit different mm-hmm. in the original languages. Um, but they, when when you read the whole thing, you get the richness of it. And Whenever I teach on topics like this, one of the first things I always say is read the whole Bible. Like, don't just read your favorite sections. That's good you have favorite sections. We all do, right? Mm -hmm. That just resonate more with us and whatever. That's not a bad thing. Uh, But to really understand the richness of it, read the whole thing, even the parts maybe you've never read before. And you start to pick up uh, that they're all they're all saying the same thing. They're pointing in the same direction. But everything is expressed um, from the context that it's coming from or, or the genre of the writing that's being used. And so... Uh, yeah, the, like again, the, the dominant theme is is God revealing Himself to humanity, like who He is, um, who we are in relationship to Him, and then of course the story unfolds with with sin and you know forgiveness and redemption and how all that whole the, kind of that arc plays out. That's mm-hmm. kind of the overall theme, uh, but we really don't get to understand it unless we read all of it and read big right. chunks of it, right? And then we see those those voices actually working together beautifully. Yeah. Now, there were other things that were written as the Bible came mm. into an, its existence, mm-hmm. which people had to decide, yeah. hey, it's part of this story or not. Yeah, um, yeah I do want to speak yeah. to that because, I mean, there are other traditions which in their Bible mm-hmm. will have things that are not in a Protestant Bible. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, un- unpack that a little yeah. bit, because I think that confuses people sometimes. Yeah, I th- and I think, well, it confused me until I, you know, I've been fortunate to actually study some of this stuff over years and be taught by various people, and that's like, oh, that's how it works, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's something that we don't think we intuitively know. We know there's something there, but we don't know the answer to it, right? And so, I mean, you talked about canon and a concept mm-hmm. of canon, and, and same as today, if you're a movie, you know, Buffy, the Star Wars canon or the MCU canon, right? It's just a way of, of different... Uh, you know, a recognized collection. Exactly, right? Yeah. What's in and what's out, what's yeah. official and what's not. Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing with the Bible. What, what books are in there and what books aren't, and how do we know the right books are in and, and all that? And so going really big picture, within Christianity, there's three big branches, Orthodox Christianity, Roman Catholic Christianity, and Protestant Christianity. That'd be a whole other conversation to unpack all mm-hmm. that and how they work together. Um, but all three of those uh, would include the Old Testament and the New Testament right. as canonical. Like mm-hmm. There'd be no disagreement, mm-hmm. no argument. That's just kind of, it's been accepted for a long time. Uh, in Orthodox and Roman Catholic Bibles, they would also include something called the Apocrypha. 
And so that, uh, what the Apocrypha is, there's about 14 books uh, that are written between the Old and New Testaments. And at different points in history, uh, different church councils would give them different weight. Um, and it actually took a long time for them to be actually officially recognized as, as canon by the Roman Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. But Protestant churches have never done that. And so the understanding there is they're, they're good books, uh, they're really helpful for understanding history and right. what was going mm -hmm. on in those days, but they're not the same level as Scripture. Mm. Uh, they didn't make any of those lists in the early church, uh, and, so, and they were known then, but they were, they were, they're valuable books, but they're not the level of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Like when we talk about Scripture, we often use the language of authoritative or inspired or God-breathed, yeah. and those, those descriptions apply to Old Testament or First Testament and New Testament only. Yeah. I, I find it, um, people often have questions of doubt around the Bible itself. Mm -hmm. I remember when the Da Vinci Code came out and it was such a big yeah. hit. And, you yeah. know, the conversations around other Gospels yeah. that weren't included in the Bible we now read, and it was a power play. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to touch on that a bit? Like, yeah. if, if you've read some of these Gospels, yeah. it's almost like... I can see why they weren't included, right? Exactly, and I think that's part of it. When you read the scriptures, and then there's something that's you read, and you kind of go, "This just intuitively even doesn't even feel like it's the same kind of thing." Yeah, that's, that should be a clue we pay attention to, right? Yeah. Like that's, I would say that's actually the Holy Spirit starting to speak into us mm -hmm. and saying, "Okay, notice there's something different here. Pay attention to that." But what's fascinating about many of those texts, the uh, Gospel of Thomas, the Nag Hammadi text, or some of those texts, uh, they're actually written later than the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they're not, they weren't written in, by, the, by Jesus or his, or none of them were written by Jesus, yeah. but by his contemporaries right. and like the, the, early, apostles, the, early, basically. Yeah, the early church leaders. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they come later in history. Yeah. And so, again, they're, they're valuable because they should give insight into what people were thinking. Yeah. Um, but the early church, the first Christians, the first councils, never considered them. Uh, as canonical, and they were people who who knew the apostles, who who wrestled with this deeply, um, mm -hmm. and so yeah, they're interesting, but they just uh, they're they're out of sync, and the ch the church has never really accepted them mm -hmm. um, because of because of their late date and because of uh, yeah. their anonymous nature. Makes for a good movie, though. Makes for a great movie, <laughs> totally. It does, yeah. yeah. It's not so much for scriptural study. Another question that people have, and I, I think it's a legit one, is. Like this was written a long time ago. Mm -hmm. How does this? How is this relevant to my life? And especially in the Old Testament. I mean, we're we're uh, in our series. We've dived into Second uh, Timothy three sixteen seventeen, which talks about all Scripture right. is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And then he yeah. goes on to say what it's profitable for. Yeah. And he's really referring to the Old Testament Scriptures at he that was. point, being yeah. profitable. Yeah. And yet you read some of the stuff in the Old Testament, yeah. and some of it seems so crazy. Some of it seems so outdated. Yeah. So how yeah. can this book actually yeah. be relevant to yeah. our lives today? That's it. That's a great question. I think there's a couple of layers to that, too. Mm -hmm. One is just reminding ourselves that it has... It is God revealing himself to us. It has originated from God. So by that definition, it has to be timeless and cross-cultural and because it's not, a, it's not just a human construct, right? And if it was just a human construct, then you could say, okay, well, it's just relevant to the context that it came out of, but it actually originates from God. Mm -hmm. And so that, by definition, means it will always be relevant in every context. Um, otherwise, it wouldn't be, uh, like you said, God-breathed and inspired and, and profitable for everything that, that Scripture says is profitable for. Um, but on a kind of a more specific level then, one of the keys to, I think, to making it more applicable and having, you know, when I read it going, oh, I see how this connects with me in my life and what's going on in the world, is understanding that of those 66 books, um, they all have different genres and different mm -hmm. ways of communicating truth. And so, like the, say, the, as an example, the Old Testament in the Psalms, um, which, you know, were these really expressive, raw, emotional texts. And so how do you go, well, what am I supposed to do with that? Because there's the psalmist is saying that he's wishing some babies could be dashed against the rocks. Well, yes. hang on, like that's, it's offensive. It's all kinds of, right? Yeah. But then when we remember that the prop, or the psalms, I mean, are, aren't so much God's words to us, but they're actually human words to God. So these are people who know theology, who understand who God is, but they're wrestling with it. And it's kind of the human cry, the heart, where they're saying, ah, God, this doesn't make sense, or they're worshiping God, or whatever it is, right, in there. Mm -hmm. So knowing the genre and the kind of writing that it is makes me go, it makes it relevant. An example of that, I was in prison for three years as a chaplain. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you clarified yeah, that. <laughs> just to point that out. And um, 
like Psalm 88 is an amazing psalm. It starts, you know, by saying, uh, it's just, it's a very depressing psalm, actually, right? Everything is going wrong. Uh, my friends have abandoned me. God, you've abandoned me. And the last line in that psalm, like the concluding line is, darkness is my closest friend. So there's no happy ending in that psalm. Mm-hmm. In that psalm. But I remember in the prison, I would get together with inmates and I, they would read that and I'd they'd kind of direct them to that and they would be, I had no idea that was it. And they would resonate with that. Yeah. And they're suddenly going, oh, my experience, my journey, uh, that's actually connected to these people of God who have been crying these things out for years. Tell me more about this God and how could this be relevant to my life? So the relevance often can be connected to the, knowing the kind of writing that we're reading in the Bible and letting the Bible tell its own story. And then we discover that it is relevant. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Uh, another question that people often have is uh, around the idea of inconsistencies mm-hmm. or, you know, there's errors in the Bible, so yeah. how can I trust it? Yeah. yeah. How do you address that? Yeah, that's a tricky one too, right? Because like what... You know, how do we how do we determine truth? How do we determine what's accurate? That's, those are just big questions, anyways, in our culture. Um, and there, the story with the Old Testament and the New Testament are a little bit different. The Old Testament, there aren't a lot of original manu- or there's no original manuscripts, but there aren't just a lot of manuscripts at all. Uh, but the manuscripts that exist are almost the complete Bible, so Codex Leningradensis or the Aleppo Codex. Uh, they're they're the bulk of the Old Testament, and and so they've been transmitted over time. Very carefully and faithfully by Jewish scribes. Uh, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran mm-hmm. really validated that. So in terms of the Old Testament text, there's not a lot of questions about that because there's just, in, in some ways, it's kind of a boring field of study because right. those texts are so consistent. In the New Testament, though, it's a, t- a different story. Um, there are thousands of manuscripts, really. Uh, most of them are fragmentary. And so that's the sometimes where you come across texts that do say different things. You know, it's a different word or a different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what what do we do with that? Well, that's where we really rely heavily on textual critics. They're called, and so those are people who have essentially devoted their lives to these manuscripts. Uh, and they will they'll know the different text families that they came from, and they'll lay them all out essentially, and and figure out um, you know which which is the most likely reading because it, maybe it's the oldest or this the most well preserved or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they'll like it's it's incredible incredible what they do actually to, to figure this out. And so even the Greek texts that we have, uh, when there's variants, it'll actually list them you know, rated it's A, B, C, or D, depending on how high the level of confidence is that this is the original writing. And, and so most of those the variants uh, are variants in spelling um, and, and not, they're not substantive variants right. at all. Uh, so I think we have a, I personally, um, and I've, I've actually translated some of the Dead Sea Scrolls myself, uh, have a very high level of confidence mm-hmm. that the text we're reading now uh, accurately reflects what was originally written down. Right. I mean, that's a whole other discussion, right? Yeah. But yeah, very confident. Yeah. Now you've, you've been to Israel. Yes. Yeah. So have you. Yes. And I'd like to hear from you, like, how did that affect the way that you read the Bible? Yeah. Yeah, that was, I remember the first time we went there. Um, it was kind of like going from looking at a, a, a picture in black and white uh, and suddenly seeing it in color. Hmm. And it just it just opened up, uh, right? And seeing, being able to, you know, see that, uh, you know, the distance from Northern Galilee to Southern Galilee, what that was, and drive that distance and go, oh, okay, so when the disciples went from here to there, like I can kind of have that in my mind. And and so it it opened it, it brought so many stories in the Bible to life because I could, I could imagine myself being there. I mean, obviously, the you know, a thousand years later, two thousand years later, that's not the same trees. It's not that. So it's a different. Right. Mm-hmm. But you get the sense of of scale, and you see that it happened in real life. And you imagine. I remember one uh, story or experience. We were in Jerusalem, and the steps uh, going down to the priest's house when Jesus got crucified. Right, and that's one of the few places there where. Uh, historians and archaeologists say those are actually the original steps, right? Mm-hmm. And so going, wow, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was actually walking down those steps. Uh, like those, not, not a replica of the steps, right? But those were the, actually the steps. Yeah. And so it just breathes life and, and op- kind of opens your eyes to, to, how, to those experiences in the Bible, right? And it's not just words on a page anymore. It's actually, yeah. Yeah. you can imagine it. Yeah, and that God actually stepped into history. Uh, exactly. In you know, a real place in a particular... It's real. ...in a particular time. Totally. Yeah, yeah, so incredible. Yeah, I think it made me a better Bible teacher too then, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. it's easier to communicate something that you've experienced in multiple ways. So not just by reading it and and the Holy Spirit speaking and guiding, but actually physically seeing things too, right? All those go together. Yeah, one of the things I 
um, being there reminded me of was how much more work there is to be done in the field of archaeology. Mm. Like there are so many mm. sites that oh. they have just really scratched the surface. And I think yeah. over the, the last number of decades, they keep finding things that verify the Bible. Yeah. And for places that we have questions, I would just say to people, just hang on to your questions. Um, yeah. Because as we keep doing more exploration, uh, some of those questions, you know, hopefully uh, yeah. will be answered. Um, and, and again, verify that what's recorded here actually, exactly. actually happened. And lack of evidence is different than contradictory evidence. Exactly. Right? And yeah. so, yeah, it's just, yeah, I agree, totally agree with that. Mm. Uh, how, how can we go about reading this Bible rightly? Mm. Then it's because it is a bit of a complicated piece, right? It you is. talked about different genres. Yeah. We talk about like such a great time length yeah. from beginning to to when it's you know finally finished. Yeah. Um, what are some really important yeah. insights that you could give us how to read it rightly? Yeah, how to read it well. In no order of priority, I'd say one would be to read big chunks. I think some too often we just read a verse or a sentence or a paragraph. If I were to send you an email you know, today, you wouldn't just read the first sentence and then stop, and then maybe two weeks later pick up another sentence or whatever, or go right to the end and, and or scan it and say, oh, this one jumps out to me. Like you'd read the whole thing, right? right? Because it was written that way and you'd read the whole thing. And one of the best things we can do is read big chunks of scripture. If it's a New Testament, you know, reading a, one of the letters, maybe that takes five minutes for the short ones, it takes 45 minutes, whatever it is. Um, I love how as a church we're going through the Gospel of John, like mm -hmm. we're reading a big chunks of that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's... That on a, a kind of on a, a skill or a tactical level is probably the most important thing. Read mm. big chunks, read slowly. Um, notice what the text is actually saying not, and not what it's not saying. Like actually just kind of assume the Bible can speak for itself. And so read big chunks and read slowly. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, I would say it's because it's not just a book, it actually originates from God. There's also spiritual elements to that. Like do we, are we spending time in prayer? Uh, are we inviting the Holy Spirit to open our eyes? Not so we have some sort of weird, unique thing, whatever, but so that we actually mm -hmm. see the truth in there. Are we doing it in community? Are we doing that with other people who are also, uh, you know, maybe uh, mature followers of Jesus who have spent time reading Scripture? Again, the goal is not to be unique, but it's to be faithful. What does it actually say, right? right. And so slowing yeah. down big chunks, uh, consciously inviting the Holy Spirit to speak into us uh, and to mm -hmm. and with others, I think, are key. Obviously, if you have opportunity, uh, take courses, read good books on some of the, th the, the methods of reading the Bible, the different genres and, mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Those are really good too. But even without that, just uh, slowing down, reading big chunks, asking God to speak, it's actually really powerful. Okay. Uh, what would you want to make sure that, I mean, you teach on the subject... For let's say uh, a beginner, intermediate, yeah. and then someone who's you know mm. been doing this for a long time. Yeah. If you had one thing to say to each one of those three categories, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, for the beginner, maybe I'd repeat what I just said, right? For the, okay. the beginner, read mm -hmm. big chunks, yeah, um, and and find other people who would like to do that with you, regardless of where they are in their faith mm -hmm. or if they even don't even have any faith in Jesus. But yeah. just you know, as a start, just start by reading it, and and maybe uh, some of the Old Testament or New Testament stories, the narrative sections, uh, you know, or those are the are good places to start because they. They're stories. They read like stories, right. and they're easier to mm -hmm. kind of get into. So the Book of Acts, uh, the Gospels, uh, you know, Genesis. Uh, those, like, you know, and and don't don't read it to figure it out. Read it to just kind of immerse yourself in it. Mm -hmm. and I would that would be some advice there uh, for intermediate. Um, I don't I don't know how we define these categories, but whatever. Neither do I. Whatever, whatever they are, yeah. <laughs> so some maybe who's been doing this for a little while, yeah. right? And going, oh, I'm not totally. I, I I like it. I've read it. I'm not sure if I'm reading it well or yeah. whatever. Uh, I, all the same things would apply. I wouldn't. I wouldn't change any mm -hmm. of that. But then maybe I would would add, um, as you're reading, start making notes of what you notice and what you see, mm -hmm. and and you know maybe even consciously saying, um, asking God in prayer before you start to show you something in the text. Again, not a weird mystical show me some secret thing, right? But yeah. God, and and then notice what you see in the text. Repeated words. Um, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And just kind of mm -hmm. like, just kind of read it a little more carefully. And so why is the author s keeps on saying this? Or why is it yeah. changed from this to that? Like, just kind of be more, read well, like any book we would read, yeah. read it well. Yeah. Uh, and then if you were, um, 
I, I, advanced isn't the right word, but whatever the word yeah, is, yeah, right? Yeah. Say you want to study deeply. Yeah. Then I would say actually pick multiple translations. We haven't mm -hmm. really talked about translations mm -hmm. really, but um, there are there are a range of translation theories, and there's good Bibles that will translate using different theories. And yeah. so knowing, uh, picking a few Bibles, maybe two or three from kind of different styles mm -hmm. of translating, yeah. uh, and and reading all three of them because there's no perfect translation. There just there isn't right. There, yeah. There's better and there's worse for yeah. sure, but there's no yeah. perfect. And so I'd say all those things and read in multiple translations, and then um, lead a small group, lead a Bible study, do something with it, right? Mm -hmm. and because we learn tons when we try to communicate it to others. Right. Yeah, I actually have a friend of mine who was telling me he reads through the Bible every year, mm -hmm. and he reads through a different translation every year. Yeah. And he's found that that really helps trigger yeah. new insights for him. Yeah, um, good idea. But even not doing that, I, I just have to say for myself personally, um, you know, having read, teach, preach yeah. out of the Word, I'm always amazed how there is more oh. to learn. And again, you know, it's not just us as we read this. The Holy Spirit is yeah. also involved. Yeah. He, he's, you know, Jesus said He will teach us, He will lead us, He will guide us. Yeah. And so, so true. Um, we never exhaust the depths of yeah. uh, what God has to reveal about Himself, which I think is where the Bible is is taking us to a deeper relationship with Him. Yeah. But also to see ourselves and the world more yeah. rightly. Yeah. And I know that I personally, you know, I'm influenced by the, the world that I live in, yeah. and I, I need His Word to continually help reshape my thinking correctly yeah. from God's perspective. In some ways, it's like a lens, right? That we, God is, you know, it's, is, He's giving us a lens that we can look through and see Him, but the same way, we can actually take that lens and look through Scripture and see others, including ourselves, right? But it's, yeah. it's, it's, what, it's what brings things into focus. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Any final comments you want to give us? Oh no! Just I, I love this. I love scripture. I, I love the author of scripture, and we have to make sure both those go together. Absolutely. Right. And as long as we pursue both of those, yeah. uh, then history would show, my own life would show, God does amazing things, and it's yeah. a great journey to be yeah. on. Yeah. Yeah. Let's remember these are God's words, and as we read His words, they lead us to Him, they do. which leads to life. And uh, if you've been watching today, I hope this helps encourage you uh, in the Bible to get into or keep on in the scriptures and allow his Holy Spirit to speak to you through them and then go out and do it too, mm -hmm. uh, lest we become deceived. Thanks yeah. for watching. Thanks, Mark, for being our guest. Thanks, Tim.